Well, I'm Dane, and this is Dan Explains. According to the theory of evolution, the way you get species is via natural selection, working on an isolated population of organisms over many generations, eventually resulting in a new species. At least that's a simplified explanation of it anyway. However, that's not always the case. People have proposed that the eastern coyote in North America is not the same species as the western coyote, because it's substantially different from western coyotes. Interestingly, western coyotes only started moving east and became eastern coyotes in less than 100 years. Let me explain why. The story of the eastern coyote is pretty easy to understand. After European settlers arrived in North America, they put a substantial effort into eliminating the gray wolf. They succeeded in extirpating the wolf from much of the eastern United States and Canada. This coincided with the increase in human population, making a lot of the wolf's former habitat fragmented. This left a void that western coyotes were at least partially adapted to fill. So as you might expect, with competition of the gray wolf eliminated, the western coyote started to move eastward to fill the void left by the gray wolf. You would also expect that according to evolution, they would also become larger to fill the large predator niche left by the gray wolf. And they did. But they did so much more quickly than evolution usually allows for. Now, there are cases where evolution can happen quite rapidly, in a theory known as punctuated equilibrium, where a species will remain the same for many generations, and then suddenly change. In fact, that is what Charles Darwin was observing on the Galapagos Islands that inspired him to come up with the theory of evolution. However, for punctuated equilibrium to work, usually you need a small isolated population, like you have on an island. This causes any beneficial genetic traits to quickly get amplified in the subsequent generations, causing large changes in even just a few generations. However, usually the changes are narrow, with just a few features of the organism changing. And, like I said, it takes a small population. The western coyote didn't get isolated on the east coast, and they not only got bigger, but their behavior changed to make them more comfortable living near humans. In fact, the western coyote's range expanded over time, which is exactly not what you'd expect for punctuated equilibrium to work. Today, we have genetic analysis to help us figure out what's going on. When analyzing the genetics of the eastern coyote, scientists found they aren't one species at all, but a hybrid of three. They found that the eastern coyote is genetically two-thirds coyote, one-quarter gray wolf, and the remaining 10% or so being domesticated dog. They found that as the western coyote moved east, they hybridized with gray wolves in the Great Lakes region. The hybridization with a domestic dog was shown to have happened only 10 to 25 generations ago, which isn't that long ago taking dog years into consideration. The hybrid coyotes were better adapted to eastern North America than their western ancestors were. The hybridization events they had with the gray wolf made them larger and better able to prey on white-tailed deer, which is one of the top prey species for wolves. The hybridization that occurred with the domestic dog reduced the coyote's natural fear of humans, enabling them better access the patchwork of human civilization and wilderness found on the east coast of North America. Analysis found these hybridization events were usually wolf or dog male to coyote female, since western coyotes have intact coyote mitochondrial DNA, which is only passed on through the female line. What all this means is that some of the organisms in the fossil record may not have arisen through natural selection through evolution, but natural selection through hybridization, especially during extinction events, which may have left large holes and niches that could be filled by hybrids of several organisms. If we don't have fossils for each step in something's evolution, there would be no way to determine exactly which way it arose especially since DNA evidence seldom survives fossilization. Now, that would make deducing the origin of some species difficult, wouldn't it? Thank you for watching. If you like this video and other topics ranging from theology to science, 
please press the like button. Subscribe to my channel and ding the bell to get notified when I post new videos. Also, please support me on Patreon to get extra content and special perks. Link in the description. The more people support me, the more time I can dedicate to making videos like this one. So, until next time, have a great week. Thank you.